The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are uh, on this globe. Uh, if everything is okay, you can see part of my face. For those of you that do not know me, my name is Nanette Ripmeister and I'll be your host uh, of this webinar. The webinar is brought to you by Career Professor, careerprofessor.works. And, okay, that's going well already. We'll be having two webinars in the series um, um, that Career Professor is organizing. The first one, that's the one that we're having today, is about how to make the most of study abroad and we'll be focusing on the university perspective. The next one with Stuart Jehan from Robeco will be on 14 March and will be about the employer perspective. Um, so we'll have two webinars around the same topic, looking at study abroad and how you can boost your employability by going abroad as a student. What I'll be talking about today, um, well, study abroad and the added value for it, first of all for students, a little bit for employers, so we have uh, those of you that cannot be there for the second webinar still have an idea about what we talk about if we talk about study abroad and the value that employers attach to it. The next topic we're going to talk about is employability and how does study abroad enhance employability. Then we move over to our guest speaker of today, Alexandra Hexman, and she'll be talking about the university perspective and what a university can do to support their students in articulating the study abroad experience. Towards the end, we'll have question and answers. In a webinar, it's always a bit strange because we do not see each other really face to face. So we will have question and answers, which will be moderated by one of my colleagues here in the office, Pavet Achter. Um, if you have a question, we ask you to type the question in the screen. Um, we cannot hear you, so even if you start shouting out loud at us, we won't hear you. There is, however, the opportunity to raise a hand. In case there's anything that's really unclear, please feel free to raise a hand and we'll pay attention to it and uh, get back to you then to find out what's the matter. It's not very polite to start with yourself, but um, since uh, I'm the one that starts off, you first see my picture with my name. I'm Nanette Ripmeister. I'm the Director of Expertise in Labour Mobility, and I'll be talking today about study abroad and employability. And then the most part of this webinar will be done by Alexandra Hexman. I'm very proud that she's here with us. For her, it's uh, late in the afternoon, early in the evening. She's at Murdoch University in Australia, Western Australia, so she's in the nice time zone as it's um, beautiful weather, beautiful summer weather over there. And uh, after my um, elaborate introduction, I'll hand over to Alex and um, she will take it from there. First of all, since we cannot see who we have in the audience, we'd like to do a poll and we'd like to know um, well, who's our audience? So I'd be keen to find out what your professional role is and could you please let us know whether you're with the international office, a career service, whether you're a company representative, a student, or whether you qualify for other. Could I please ask you to vote right now? We can see that um, not all of you have voted, so we wait for the last few votes to come in. <coughs> Sorry about that. Okay, most of you are working for the international office, followed by a career service and some company representatives. And we have um, um, a majority of other. Now, I'd be very curious, of course, to know who are the others, but that's the uh, Limitation of the webinar, we won't be able to um, do that. Okay, if we continue. Well, what's the added value of study abroad? Well, there's an easy one. You make new friends, you encounter new experiences, new stories to tell. That's always interesting. Um, but there's been recent research, and I have to... Um, links underneath as sources, 
that you also get a more creative brain. So you are able to see more blue skies. And you become more open. You develop curiosity towards others and other experience. You become even a nicer person. You become more self-aware, very important. You become more emotionally stable. You become more responsible. And you even gain more trust in humanity. So going abroad is not just new friends and new experiences, but a lot of other things that you gain while going abroad. And I'm sure that Alex will touch upon a few of these things. Well, if we look at it from an employer point of view, there's um, the Erasmus Impact Study came up with a few beautiful words there. Tolerance of ambiguity, or in normal terms, acceptance of other people's cultures and attitudes. Curiosity, openness to new experiences. Confidence, trust in one's own competence. Vigor, or the ability to solve problems. A very important point for employers, the ability that somebody can take responsibility and really come up with a solution and not just look around for their colleagues to do something. Serenity, beautiful word, but again, if you talk in normal terms, awareness of your own strengths and weaknesses, and not just own strengths, but also your own weaknesses. And decisiveness, the ability to make decisions. That's the things that employers are looking for. And I think the interesting thing, and I'm sure Alex will talk about it in more detail, is how we can learn students to talk about their study abroad experiences in terms that employers recognize. Well, the good thing about study abroad is that you start to see more blue skies, as the research that I mentioned before um, is showing us. But already Mark Twain uh, a while back mentioned that travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. And I think in today's world, it's pretty good if we educate a few people that um, well, do not listen to prejudice or narrow-mindedness. Employability, what is it? Sometimes people think that employability simply means being employable. But that's just one part of it. I think if you talk about true employability, you talk about the feeling that every person should get and that's achieved when the person has the feeling that their talents are supported to the max and that they're geared towards using those talents in a potential new working environment. Employability consists of two things, both hard skills and soft skills. And in fact, the word soft skills, I think, is a bad word because it implies as if it's not very important. But we all know by now that soft skills do matter quite a lot. Hard skills are more industry specific, are trained by experts and are trained by higher education institutions. Soft skills um, are deemed more universal, uh, acquired by experience or maybe just by study abroad. But only if you have both in a person, you'll be able to find that job and keep on uh, to that position. At Expertise in Labor Mobility, we developed a formula for employability. And we say employability is qualifications plus work experience plus skills, somebody's skill set, multiplied by somebody's connections. In preparation for this webinar, we came up with a new one and we said, well, maybe employability is qualifications, foreign experience or study abroad, somebody's skill set multiplied again by connections. Those connections are extremely important. I'd like to do another poll because I'd like to find out, do you believe that study abroad will boost somebody's employability? So I will launch the poll right now. And I'll ask you to vote for it. Yes, do you believe study abroad will boost employability? Oh, I have to click another button, I'll find out, okay. Yeah, do you believe study abroad will boost employability? Select one, yes, no, or maybe. Thank you. Um, the ones that said maybe are, of course, the interesting 
for the discussion. Unfortunately, that's a bit more difficult during the webinar, but the vast majority said yes, employability will uh, provide somebody's, uh, will boost somebody's employability. I can see somebody has been raising a hand. Whether we share slides, yes, we do share slides uh, towards the end, so no worries, we'll show you the slides later on. But we all know that going abroad is, of course, great. You can go to the UK, Brazil, Australia, Russia, Italy, France, China, the States, the Netherlands, but not every student has the opportunity to go abroad. So as an institution, you also might want to look at other options for providing students still with these kind of You might be thinking about internationalization at home or really thinking how you can maximize an international classroom or you might be thinking about, for instance, using gamification and online tools to provide your students with more skills. And I want to show you a little movie that we made at Career Professor. So yes, study abroad is probably the best you can give your students, but even in Europe where we have quite a few study abroad possibilities um, and where it's easier to realize it, only 20% on average of our students do go abroad. What we've been trying to develop with career professors, just to give you a very uh, brief idea about it, is um, really like a route that we like to take people along to help them find their strong skills and how to prepare for that international job, but we also want to train them in how to um, understand intercultural differences. Um, if you can see on top here, this would be uh, on the website in Career Professor. This is general careers advice where you can see information on job hunting, CV writing, application letter. We had a very interesting discussion yesterday in the office with um, we have a new intern from Australia and a new intern from the Netherlands and we were talking about resumes and um, the person from Australia said that he was completely flabbergasted when he first saw a Dutch CV that had a picture on there because that in his opinion was just hilarious. Well, in this part of Career Professor we talk about general things that people need to know about looking for work in other countries, but in the game and in the country information we really train intercultural differences and if we would look at the country information people would be able to click on various countries, they have to by a gamification unlock different countries, for this purpose we've unlocked Australia and um, I thought it would make uh, a lot of sense to end my introduction to employability and study abroad um, by showing a slide on Australia and then handing over to our guest speaker from Australia. I'm extremely proud to have Alex Heckman with us, or Alexandra Heckman, originally Dutch, uh, and that was our first connection when I visited Perth. We just met because we were two Dutch women in Australia, and I'm very happy Alex, that you're now taking over for me in the presentation and explaining what a university can do to help students articulate their study abroad experiences and boost their own employability. Alex, the floor is yours.
Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah? Can everyone hear me? Well, I'm hoping so because I am going to present. And uh, here I go. Welcome everyone. It's a, a delight to have you all here and um, yeah, to be able to share some of my knowledge and expertise in the study abroad experience, particularly from a university perspective. This is something that Universities Australia, which is a large organisation that represents all the universities here in Australia, both public and private, uh, they've put together a big symposium to which I intended yesterday, recognising that a study abroad experience is a very powerful approach for students to take to enhance employability, particularly now that we're living in such a global community. And in the past, we've worked as separate units. We have a study abroad or international mobility office operating on campus or university campuses. And we also have the career center, careers and employment center. Now, over the years, there's been a little bit of crossover, but it became more enhanced, I'd say, about three years ago when the university was awarded a grant, this is Murdoch University, to explore and develop a program called Bringing the Learning Home. It was a project that engaged academics headed by Dr. Jan Gothard, who was a global mobility, global engagement expert, background in history and sociology. And uh, she approached the Career Centre together with the Teaching and Learning Centre who developed a really nice media package to um, look at distributing that information to students across the board. They could access their information online and start clarifying their study abroad experience. So I came in as a guest presenter to start looking at their various experiences and re-articulating them into statements that students could use when they were going for job interviews. Now, in the past, they often thought, oh, I had a great time studying abroad. Um, I experienced so many different um, episodes, travels, met so many people. But translating that into employment was something that they hadn't really made the connection until this was unpacked. So I'm going to talk about how the university now offers pre-departure programs and re-entry programs in which the Careers Centre has a significant contribution. So first of all, we really recommend that you don't wing it, so to speak. So any student that goes overseas, they really need to think about why they are going. It's not just, hey, this opportunity exists, I can go and study in South Korea or in Paris or in Mexico. It's more than that. It's about how they can make it meaningful as part of their academic studies and take the knowledge and experience with them to the next phase of their career development, which is beyond university. So what we do is we start off with student applies to the study abroad office to um, investigate the possibility of going overseas for a semester or for a year, depending on whether it's an exchange program or study abroad. And they have to um, they have to attend a pre-departure program. That's where they learn about insurance. Insurance is provided by the university for free as part of their enrolment, so that's really excellent. But they're also privy to in-country information. And there are study abroad expos on campus where students can actually go and talk to other students who have been abroad and they share their experiences. This is all about familiarising themselves with the potential that lies ahead. We then go in the pre-departure session, the career development advisor, which is invariably me or one of my colleagues, will talk about how they can actually connect their study abroad experience to career development. And this is something that we have developed because we have identified the employability skills as described by the Department of Employment and Workplace Relations, which is our federal government department. So they have a loose understanding of this before they go. And then when they come home, they're invited to bring the learning home, have an unpacking session, 
to discuss their experiences and have some guidance as to how to fine tune those experiences and articulate them for the purposes of a cover letter for application, a resume or CV, depending which country you're from, because in Australia we like to say CV, Americans like to say resume. Now there's a little bit of an overlap with those two terms. And also how to talk about it in a job interview. So we'll move on and I'll explain this connecting study abroad to career development a little bit further. It's very important to have some goals, really important to plan this experience. That way you can have a finer experience or the student will have a more informed experience. They will know how to negotiate the experience far more effectively because they're well prepared. They're also encouraged to identify the skills for the changing job market. We usually deliver that in discussion form, but at the same time we give the students some prompters as to what those skills actually are, namely creativity and cognitive skills. Going, going abroad, I think one discovers that they have to be creative so much more. As human beings, we are we are, initial, we are essentially creative beings, but we don't, don't often always get to see how we operate until we're in an unfamiliar environment and we become quite creative as we adapt and um, try and fit in or explore or observe and see what that means to us. We also have to process those experiences. What do they mean to us? Where are our preconceptions? What roles do they play? Cross-cultural awareness, of course, is in, instrumental in all of this, and this is something that Nanette has already spoken about. The other changing, like what we call skills for the changing job market, is entrepreneurship. This is becoming very big now. Again, uh, governments are now taking away some of their own responsibilities of providing huge public services, jobs for all in the public service, etc. They really do want to encourage people to start becoming more independent, working for themselves, setting up businesses, thinking outside the box. The world is rapidly changing from information technology to renewable energy to new ways of responding to climate change. A lot of this requires thinking differently, that a number of universities are even introducing units of study that explore entrepreneurship. I think study abroad is one of those areas where that is really enhanced because we see the way things are done in a different way. We get ideas when we're abroad and think, oh, I'd like to try that, bring that home, or maybe I can explore it, or we don't have that service or facility at home. Maybe I can look at ways of getting some some cooperation or some thought around that. Maybe I could set a little business up myself in that direction and start utilising the resources and services and facilities that are available in my own um, city. Emotional intelligence is another one. That's become a very, very big issue and I'll talk a little bit more about emotional intelligence later onwards and you'll see what I mean. So, moving onwards, set your goals. First of all, commit to total immersion. We really don't encourage students to, um, if they're Australian students for example, to hang out with other Australian students at their host university. It's easy to do. It becomes clicky, but the students are not necessarily exploring beyond their own comfort zone. It's about pushing those boundaries further, learning about new cultures, new ways of being. It's just such an enriching experience. So some universities offer intensive language courses pre-departure, which is really fantastic, so that's very, very helpful. Or you can get one of those fantastic apps for your phone that uh, helps to translate some of these languages, some better than others, but it's really worth exploring that. We also recommend that you expand your use of technology in terms of journaling, writing down your experiences, your how you responded to challenging situations, what you learned, what that meant for you. 
It might not make so much sense at the time when you're writing it, you're just putting together your thoughts and your experiences, but later on which you'll start seeing a pattern forming, an interesting insight into the way you responded to challenges. It says a lot about you. In other words, going study abroad, you really get have the opportunity to meet yourself. We also suggest that you look for experience, whether it's volunteering work, maybe there's an internship happening at that university that you can apply for. Uh, a number of countries are very strong on internships, particularly the United States, Germany, etc. Australia is not as strong in internship provision for uh, people who are studying abroad. However, that climate, that service is starting to change. In fact, one of our large banking groups uh, will only recruit their graduate recruitment through their graduate recruitment program. They will only recruit participants who participated in their internship program. So must do an internship first, then eligible to join the graduate recruitment program. So this is very interesting. We're starting to see some rapid changes in those areas. But where possible at your host university, look at internships wherever you can. They're fantastic. Um, you might want to design and implement, manage a particular project of yours as part of your course study. Later onwards I'll show you a, a little excerpt of a resume that actually shows where a student who went to the Danish School of Media and Photojournalism designed and managed a project and you'll see how it's written up. Most of all, go with purpose in mind. Always think of the why. Why am I going to, for a study abroad? Is it to broaden my life experience, learn a new subject, gain confidence, learn a new language, at how things are done differently? Look at how some countries might be responding to the current refugee crisis. There are so many options and reasons for one for why you might want to go, but it's very important to have that clear purpose. So the desirable skills that I was telling you about earlier for changing the job market, uh, desirable skills for the changing job market I should say, entrepreneurship is important of course, critical thinking, web communication, well that's very big, we're communicating so much stronger in that platform. Definitely working in culturally diverse teams, for example here at Murdoch University we're running a nursing uh, degree program and Increasingly, we are attracting more students who come from Africa and uh, the Middle East. And then transitioning into the workplace, because there's more people uh, like uh, the public who are using the medical services, the hospital systems, many who cannot speak the language, these nurses who come from culturally diverse areas are able to assist some of the patients through translations. In fact, a number of them have been using that as part of their um, evidence for when they're discussing their ability to work in culturally diverse settings and communicate with culturally diverse people as part of that interview process when they're applying for jobs in the hospitals. Soft skill development is really important. We consider that to be the glue. We learn the hard skills, the technical skills as part of the university degree, but often the soft skills such as how to work in teams, um, strengthening the interpersonal skills, the um, problem solving skills, they're kind of hidden or they're, they're sort of built in the learning but a lot of that development is very much a responsibility for the student themselves to develop further. That's the sort of stuff that makes employers think, yeah, I think I can work with you. I think you can work with Grumpy Mary on the front desk. I think you can liaise with some of our harder to reach target markets because you've got strong interpersonal skills and you know how to network. It's that kind of thing. That's why I always refer to it to those, the soft skills as the glue. Self-management, well that comes up very strongly when you're on a study abroad experience because you really are managing yourself, you're on your own, you no longer have your parents to look after you or your family or your friends who always support you. Uh, this is very much, you're on your own, even though you meet new people in your new environment, uh, there are student services people in the universities that can assist you, but essentially the responsibility lies on, on student to seek out that 
assistance or the services. Again, the opportunity to meet themselves. The emotional intelligence one is really important. A number of employers are recognising that they want people, no matter what their age is, to be very responsible for themselves. So if there's a conflict in the workplace, for example, rather than looking or blaming the other person, emotional intelligence is all about looking at the issue rather than the person. How can one be an objective observer or objectively solve the problem in a manner that's going to um, diffuse a problem, to encourage uh, cooperation from other staff members, respect and ease in the workplace. So there are many examples where we may have seen this in group settings and so what we do now as part of the Career Centre services, we're actually running programs on how to work in groups because often students are given assignments to do and they're told to form a group, go away and do the assignment and then do a presentation at the end. But often they don't really know how to make that the group dynamic work, to make it flourish, uh, getting recognising the strengths of each member in that group, using the emotional intelligence yet again to engage in a confident, supportive, reflective and respectful manner in that group. That translates effectively to the workplace. Now, as I mentioned earlier, our careers team is working increasingly with the international office mobility teams. This is to ensure a holistic experience through the presentation and pre-departure and returning home workshops so the students immediately can see that there's other services within the university that are there to assist them to expand their experience, to see its relevance in terms of future employment and employability. Our job, therefore, is to really hone in on those experiences and see how that we can turn these students into magicians and see how those experiences are actually employability skills. And then we transform them into resumes and cover letters. They put them together in our workshops and then they submit them to us online and we give them feedback that way. So, here we've got a list of skills which employability skills and attributes are fostered in study abroad exchange experience. More or less, all of them are important, some more than others. So emotional intelligence, and truly, I've said it before, it's a strong one um, for study abroad. You really get large doses of it. Problem solving, responding to challenges. Yes, you know, maybe you lose your passport. You have to go and deal with the foreign exchange office or the, the embassy of your country to get those papers organised. It happened to one of our students just three weeks ago and she had to miss her flight. That affected um, her enrolment and subsequent units for the new semester commencing. It's all very interesting. But uh, through the um, study abroad office and also because she was on Facebook with uh, me and a few of my teammates, we were able to give us some advice as to what she could do uh, to address that. We gave us some um, contacts from our alumni living over there as well because she felt completely on her own in that desperate situation or what she thought was desperate at the time. Anyway, problem solved through online contact and communication. Cognitive flexibility is really important. It's when you're studying a new, when the students are studying a new course, uh, teaching modality is different. Uh, the way it's taught, new words, different constructs, uh, our minds start working differently, start responding differently. So we have to be far more flexible in that. Cultural diversity, of course, working in diverse teams comes into it. Challenging beliefs and preconceptions is a big one, actually. Um, we often think that a certain culture might behave in a certain way until we actually meet these people. And most of the universities around the world now are becoming far more multicultural. So I think it's really good. We encourage our students on international days here to mix with other student groups and cultural groups who do presentations, etc get a good dose of it when you're overseas. 
negotiation skills for tricky situations, of course, or acquiring a, or negotiating accommodation and prices. Language acquisition, hopefully, that is enhanced if the student is really committed to that and that's one of the objectives. Communication interpersonal skills for making friends, using blogs, using social media, writing your experiences in a journal or e-portfolio. This can all be unpacked later onwards on the returning home session. And of course critical thinking, that always goes with academic learning. So there, here is this lovely poll that we had for you. Do you think study abroad enhances employability skills but not necessarily employment prospects? It's uh, quite similar to what Nanette was speaking about earlier, uh, but a number of students will think that, ha, huh, I've been abroad and therefore my employment prospects will increase. What do you think about this one? I'll wait for you to gather your thoughts and poll away. Aha, it does. That's very good. I totally agree with you all, so I will include myself in that 100%. Okay, uh, now my slideshow has moved a little bit, so here we go. Yeah, thank you for that response. So the next thing, what I've got here is an example of goal setting and outcomes. This is a beautiful example. Justin came to see me at, I think it was about November last year, and he was all excited. He'd learned about a study abroad opportunity in South Korea, but he didn't have the money to be able to go for this. He had some good marks, but he thought, well, you know, he didn't think his chances were very good because it had to do with the new Colombo plan, which is this new initiative that our federal government had put into place, and it's highly competitive. However, he decided to give it a go, and he wrote his application, and he asked the study abroad office to give it a look over. And then he came with that document and asked us to look it over. He also asked a previous participant on an exchange program to do the same thing. That previous participant had won a scholarship with the New Colombo Plan earlier. I need to explain that briefly, what the New Colombo Plan is. For many years here in Australia, if any student went to study abroad or they would do an exchange, they were very desirous of going to America, to Europe, etc. And yet Southeast Asia, which was our nearest neighbours, was often overlooked. And, and also, we had a number of Southeast Asian students coming over to Australia to study. But it seemed to be a one-way process. Australians would only go there on holidays, but they didn't really think about making the study connection. So the new Colombo plan was put in place and uh, it's starting to receive a lot of attention. So we've got some fantastic exchange programs in India, not India, sorry, Indonesia, which is called an in-country consortium, and they learn about journalism and they do an internship there. Anyway, that's another program, but it's all part of the new Colombo plan process. So he applied for the scholarship, but he knew that he needed to raise a bit more money to be able to enjoy a few side trips and, and see what he could do. So he set up some movie nights, posted it on social media, had a number of people going along, so he raised some extra funds. So he was actually showing a little bit of an entrepreneurial spirit, which is a nice idea, to finance that venture. He also had, as I said earlier, his application checked, and that resulted in him uh, going to Canberra, which is our um, main capital city in Australia where Parliament lives, to uh, be interviewed for this particular scholarship. Anyway, he came back to us and said, prior to going to this interview by the way, he wanted to have some tips on interview skills and what sort of questions would he likely be asked. So we preempted some of the questions. Fortunately, some of those questions were asked in the interview and he was quite well prepared. So what actually happened is he was awarded the scholarship on the basis of his academic performance. His community leadership he wasn't very strong on and so he came to us to say how can I actually explain what I do here. I play trumpet in a band and uh, we do it for some uh, you know, old people's residences and uh, for any kind of cultural 
a day like a German beer fest day or whatever, he said, but nothing more formal than that. And yet he was the one who would introduce the band to the people and he would be distributing cards and you know to get more gigs. So he was actually showing a bit of leadership in, in marketing ideas. He also grew fabulous reg vegetables, the largest pumpkins we'd ever seen and used social media to sell them. They were all organic. So he was engaging in a number of fun activities just to, to show that he has got a little bit of community leadership there in his own way. But he was very passionate about forging long-term relationships with the Indo-Pacific region. So anyway, he then thought about his aim because we said to him, we asked him, well, you know, if you go overseas, what do you really want to do? What is your aim? He said, I'm passionate about renewable energies. South Korea is doing some fabulous work there. The units that are being offered at Yonsei University actually inform my interest in that area. And maybe, just maybe, I can build partnerships when I return, maybe through the um, Sustainable Energy Engineering Association or through some other groups. Who else can I contact? So we went through our resources and we were able to give them some further ideas. Then he started to engage with everything, with, with his whole experience. He's invited key academics, careers people and the international mobility staff to view his Facebooks and he continuously documents his experiences, sends us short videos, etc. As a result of his fine application, our Foreign Affairs Minister, Julie Bishop, actually appointed him Fellow for South Korea on behalf of NCP. He never ever expected that this would happen. He was quite a humble character. And uh, this was a wonderful surprise. And he said to us, you know, if I hadn't applied, if I didn't think I could do it, he said, I just went on a whim. I would never be where I am now. He said, I just took the plunge. And he said, I learned something about fail. Fail. First attempt in learning. That's how you spell fail. He thought, well, I can risk it, I can fail, or I can learn from the experience. Well, he actually won, so it was fantastic. He also chatted to us about his career goals and we were able to fine tune them. Yes, he wanted to be a researcher to start off with and he wanted to be a science communicator by his own radio program one day. And we said, well, so it happens you could do a postgraduate certificate in, in radio production here at Murdoch. And that's another thing, study abroad often facilitates further study. So it's very much in the interest of career services and student mobility offices to work together for the future students office. So more and more collaboration within universities rather than having all these little satellite offices operating independently. A university means universe. And so you really need to live that out. I think our various offices which have specific roles to play in the student academic life can actually identify certain aspects of that server, of their own services that really connect with the other services and work towards unifying that service to assist the students. But it is a constant um, approach we need to take an awareness because staff come and go, etc. But we're now seeing and using data analytics to prove that it all works. Collaboration always works. So here we are, I was talking to you earlier about adding study abroad to the resume. So as you can see, here is a here's a student who is doing Bachelor of Communication and Media I'm Studies. Could you, could you start wrapping up? Oh, absolutely. All right, well these slides will be shared and you can see that it's all there and look at what they actually did. Flesh out some of the skills and experiences. How does that translate into transferable skills? It's all there. And this is my final slide, seek out opportunities to develop, to develop practical skills and experiences overseas, journal your experiences because you can be talking about that later onwards on your return, join clubs, interest groups, use social media, follow the language skills, seek alumni from home university in the host country and on return we recommend you become a global rep or a peer advisor for new study abroaders on campus. And now, 
I bring you back to this wonderful free ticket for a happy 2016 brought to you by Expertise in Labour Mobility. Thank you, Nanette, and thank you to all the listeners. Ciao. Thank you, Alex. And sorry I interrupted you towards the end. Um, we will be sharing uh, slides with you. Are there any questions for now for either Alex or myself? If you have any questions, please feel free to type them and we'll be able to, uh, or we hope we'll be able to answer them. Um, I was very happy to have Alex talking about the university perspective. On the 14th of March, we will have the other end of the spectrum where we would have a um, person from a company, not a recruiter, but a financial analyst, Stuart Jehan working for Robico in both the Netherlands and Luxembourg, but coming from uh, uh, the UK himself, who will be looking um, at what an employer wants to see in a candidate that's been abroad. What do they like or like less about people that have been abroad? Because as Alex already pointed out, it's really about being able to articulate the experience that they want to see. If there are no further questions, I would like to thank you all for being here and listening to us. I would very much like to see each of you in person, and I think there are some conferences, international conferences, coming up, at least for the higher education people, where we might be seeing one another. You will have our contact details, so if you have a question later on, feel free to get in contact with Babette Achter, and she can uh, direct you to the right person to answer the question. Thank you for being here, listening to us, and we hope to see you on the 14th of March or somewhere else around this globe. And Alex, thanks again very much for your input for today. Have a good day all. Bye. <sighs>